As the paper mache market developed and the interest in paper mache, so many different features came along that are really important for collectors to look for if you're trying to find a variety of things for your collection or to really appreciate the diversity of things that were done. I'm showing here a wonderful doll from Estelle's collection wearing her original costume from French Provence. And it's just absolutely beautifully detailed with the original ribbons, the silk apron, the pearls, and I'm going to show you that she has um, the black painted hair and then the hair, the wig, it's inserted into the slit in her hair, head once again to make it authentic. And when I turn it around, look at her coif, because the French dolls that were sold in these original folklore costumes, the, the most important part of the entire costume was the coif, and if you can find that original coif still on the doll, that's what you want to have. And this is a superb example in brilliant original colors. Beautiful face as well. Now for other features, we have this striking woman, striking in so many ways because of her original costume, wearing that famous French bonnet called a deux bonjour, or the two hellos, because she's saying hello, whether she's coming or going. It's the same half. Coming or going. And because she's wearing an original costume, underneath that hat, she has two original hats. She has the brown velvet cap with the red silk lining. And beneath that, she has the beautiful embroidered tulle cap with the ruffles around her face. And under that, she has her painted black hair. She has enamel eyes, and what's special about this doll? The eyes are flirty. A very, very rare feature to find in these early paper mache dolls. And then what may well be my favorite, because I made it, I think, lot number three in the catalog is this doll that at first glance you say, well, she is really sweet, but I, I don't know what's so really rare about her. Well, look again. Look again. Number one, she has a wooden body, which is very, very unusual to find. But number two, when I turn her around, when we take off her hat, can you see? She has a mask face. She has a form for her head and then a half Half of a head is a paper mache in the shape of a mask with painted hair and it's applied to the front of her face. And at the back is a wig. And with, I would point out, the original coiffure. Extremely rare, early doll. And again, what an incredible costume. I mean, you dream of finding them this way. And this doll just has it all. I'll show you her face mask once again. Very, very fine. And you're not even, once your top hat is on, you don't even, you don't even notice it. It's just a great, great design. Estelle did a lot of research on what are called the Stadtdamen, which were the society ladies of Germany. And these dolls were being made in Germany about the same time as the French fashion dolls, which we're all so familiar with. And the Stadtdamen were the high society, very fancily dressed ladies, very beautiful costumes, many of them made by Dressel. There's a wonderful collection of them in Estelle's, um, in Estelle's collection. You'll see uh, perhaps 15 of them in all different styles, many in their original costumes, very beautifully painted boots, some of them with the painted yellow gloves. And I picked out two to show you here that have special features you might not notice at first glance. This one, for example, yes, swivel head. You're not expecting to find that because you're thinking that they're all shoulder heads. And then she has her sculpted bodice, painted bodice, and the applied original cloth collar. Very, very rare, very wonderful doll. And a lady who, again, like those of us of a certain age, have her, their little lines in their face, and yes, she does, but it's her original finish, and I love this doll. She has so many wonderful features her glass eyes, her beautiful expression, her widow's peak of her hair that is inserted into her head. Just very beautifully done. But now look at this. This collar is actually attached to the shoulder plate, which comes down, the shoulder plate comes this way, and then the 
collar is actually glued on there, and that is entirely original to this doll. Very, very different. And I'm going to turn her around so you can see how exquisite her costume, her wig, her profile, how exquisite it all is. I'm sorry, she's made of wax, and so she has, she has her age issues, but I just think that it's time we grow up in the doll world and realize these dolls for how extraordinary they are. Estelle certainly did, and she really made me have this great appreciation for these dolls of how rare they are, and to find them in an original costume is extraordinary. Here's the back again, if you want to see that a little more closely. And look at the way the skirt is made, the wonderful details on the front of the skirt. And then I'm going to lift it so you can see these wonderful painted boots and glued on, the stockings are fabric, glued on with their little garters and then the painted fancy red boots. And she even has this beautiful fan with the hand painted silk decorations and her original jewelry. Very, very fine. And while we're staying with wax, there are some wonderful English wax dolls, which Estelle had a great love for from during all of the time that she had spent in London. But I picked this fellow out because he's kind of personally my favorite. He has his original paper label on his chest from S. Coleman, who was one of the vendors at the Pantheon Bazaar in London. And the Pantheon Bazaar was known for arts and crafts of the time, and particularly those that dealt with wax, wax flowers, wax arrangements, and wax dolls. And that's what S. Coleman featured. And this is a wonderful doll, probably depicting, because of the size and the luxury nature of it, probably depicting one of um, Queen Victoria's children. Queen Victoria had uh, bought Balmero Castle, and she had this great fascination with Scottish lore. And they, she and her husband and their children spent a lot of time there. So here we have this doll costume um, with the Scottish plaid, and extraordinary accessories go along with this, including this piece. His little leather shoes have their original signature inside from the shoemaker. This piece, it's just a great, great item. I'm sure you'll enjoy seeing them, and you can see, which you might not appreciate if you're just looking at the catalog, the wonderful size of this boy. Now, many of you collect peddler dolls and, and love them, and you know that the, many of the peddler dolls in England were made using the uh, dolls made by C.H. White. This is a very interesting takeoff on the C.H. White dolls, a different interpretation of them. And I want you to look at it this way with the engraving in the back and the curtain because I'm going to now take this off and you can see the inside. And it's sort of a variation of a peddler doll in a way because what C.H. White did with his peddler dolls was have them hold a basket of wares filled with all little novelties, little miniature pieces. What we have here are two C.H. White dolls, the gentleman who's casually just reading his poetry or whatever, and the woman who is doing her very, very fine needlework with a needle and thread in her hand. And on the table in front of them are all these wonderful little sewing accessories, um, inkwell and quill, a candlestick, a lorgnette, and wonderful accessories of that type. So I think, again, Mr. White did a wonderful um, variation of his traditional peddler doll. Standing behind the peddler dolls is this beautiful, thick paste porcelain doll um, known as a Schwagenwald porcelain, probably by the Lippert and Haas Company of Czechoslovakia. And she is very, very stunning because she is totally original. Estelle found this in Northern England like 50 years ago. And very, very thick paste, beautiful brown eyes, and wearing her totally original costume. It's a stunning example of one of Estelle's porcelain dolls. And by the way, going back to the peddlers for a minute, there are some great examples of peddler dolls in Estelle's collection. If there was a lady doll, Estelle wanted to have it, whether it was made of wood, of wax, of cloth, of china, of bisque. Estelle loved, la, has loved and loves lady dolls, and they're, especially when they're found in their original costumes. Three of the very notable uh, sculpted hair bisque dolls from Estelle's collection are these. And this one is pictured in the um, Kramholtz book on identifying German Parian dolls. 
and certain features of her are very remarkable, such as her glass eyes, and she has an open mouth with teeth. Now, where have you seen that before? I don't think you have. I'm going to turn her so you can see her hair with the sculpted roses on top, ringlet curls at the back, and I'll tip her over now so you can see the roses at the top of her head. Very, very fine doll and superb antique silk costume. And I will point out to you a blue ribbon winner. From 1983. This exquisite model actually appeared on the cover of the Kromholtz book, Identifying German Parian Dolls, and well she should have. She's one of that rare, rare series of early sculpted hair dolls with ex an extraordinary bodice, everything going for her you can imagine. Brown hair, cobalt glass eyes, pierced ears, very ornate coiffure, and I'll show you the back in a minute, including the gold beading at the crown, and this extraordinarily painted bodice with the gold necklace outlined in gilt. And let's turn it so you can see it from all angles. This doll is one in a million. It just doesn't come along. I, I hate to ever use the phrase, the only one known to exist, but that is very possible in this instance. You can see the wonderful loop braids and ringlet curls at the back. And you notice that that decorated necklace goes all the way around the back of her hair. You can see it in between the ringlet curls at the back. Coming around again and a lovely costume as well. Very, very beautiful. And then just so you know that great things come in small packages, look at this tiny doll. She is, I think, about three or four inches tall. Very, very fine workmanship. Exquisite. Very, very early dollhouse or miniature doll. Wearing her original costume and I would like to show you the back of her hair, which, by the way, is a dark chocolate brown. It's not black. Look at how beautifully done that is. And when we bring it around again, notice the little tendrils of feathering of hair around her forehead. Such fine work to be done on such a tiny doll is, is just hard to imagine, and they just don't show up. Whoever is lucky enough to own one of the spectacular French fashion dolls or French poupées from the collection of Estelle Johnston will have a hard time deciding which to choose. And if this is one of the dolls that you should choose, you're going to have a hard time to, trying to figure out how to display it in your home. Because as you undo her level of costuming, every level is just as beautiful as, as the one below it. And so when her jacket comes off, for example, you'll find that her gown is exquisite, complete in detail. And look at the jewelry on here. Wonderful turquoise jewelry. Stunning evening bag, which you can open to reveal that it actually is a Vienna dance bag. Beautiful piece with the little dance card inside. Now, why I wanted to show you this girl in particular is this is the early period of the Smiling Brew. This is their deposed model. Not deposed until 1872 when it had that much more accentuated and distinctive face. But this was, was a, the Brew model. She, this is the J size, which is the larger size. And she has her original wig. And she has the classic Brew body, which they were made in many variations. And this one has the kid torso and legs and the wooden articulated arms, which is great if you like to pose your dolls and have them in different moves because you can actually pose those wooden arms. And let's just turn the doll completely around so you can see all of her details. Original wig. Look at that costume in the back. Is that stunning? Look at how that gown is fitted. You're going to want to study that if you like costume. You're going to want to study that to see exactly the way it is created. And then there she is again. And you can see all of her wonderful accessories and features.
Now, Rue deposed the wooden body of his doll in 1867. This would have been just in time for the International Exposition in Paris, and I keep harping on this because I think we don't pay as much attention as we should to the International Expositions of the 19th century because they really were the inspiration for so many designs that came along, whether it was the Paris in 1867 and 1878 and 1889, or whether it was the Chicago in 1893, or the earlier ones in London. All of these international fairs, people were competing, and they were doing new designs, and they wanted to win the gold medal award, just like people want their dolls to win blue ribbons today. So, Rue deposed his articulated wooden body. And I want to show this to you. In 1867, he deposed this very distinctive wooden body, different than any of the other wooden bodies that the doll makers were making. Now, what was the inspiration for Brew for making this body? It was none other than the 19th century mannequin doll that had been made, oh, for 100 years, perhaps. It was designed for artists to use as um, mannequins when they were doing sculptures or painting in the days before the time when it was really possible to have a lot of people doing the actual new posing. And so here were this distinctive doll. And you will look how all of the features match, from the swivel waist to the dowel articulation, even the dowel articulation of the ankles. This was the inspiration for Brew. And while we're looking at that, I also wanted to show you another example. These are both from Estelle's collection. Another example of the artist mannequin from that time period, this one being a little bit different, but perhaps something that inspired one of the other doll makers that were making wooden bodies for that exposition, because it had banding, leather banding, at all of the joints. Very, very different. See the banding there? A way of perhaps making it more secure, more stable. We don't know. I've never seen this before, and I think it's quite interesting. Nevertheless, Rue deposed this style body and it was made in various ways. It could be made as a kid body with wooden arms, such as our large doll is that we just saw. Or it could, um, it could just have all of the different kinds of variations. It always had this kid collar. It. This is an example from Estelle's collection. She does have a lovely costume. We'll just start showing it here. She has a wonderful original wig with a beautiful poupée comb in the back of her hair. and so many possibilities to articulate the doll, including the jointed ankles. Now in 1872, Leon Casimir Brew went a step further, and he deposed this face, which is always known as a smiling face, and has been suggested that it might have been inspired by the Empress Eugenie, or might have been inspired, and this is more likely, by a classic image of an angel that was very, very popular throughout 19th century Europe. And you find it in many, many sculptures and paintings. I'm inclined to agree with the angel theory, because in eight, by 1872, Empress Eugenie had been deposed, and she was off in London. I mean, her, their reign was over. So unless Mr. Brew was making a political statement, making that face of her in 1872, it's more likely that he was inspired by the angel, just as he had been inspired by the mannequin in making his wooden body. Nevertheless, the facial model is very, very unique, and there's two examples. This one is with the all-kid body, and this one is with, once again, the all-wooden, fully articulated body. And look at the costume on this, wow. her cap, her original wig. Absolutely spectacular. And this one, another wonderful example in original costume as well. 